Oh, I have all these questions in my head. It's time for questions. It is that time. Uh, this is our first Patreon Q&A, because a month ago we started a Patreon, and we have this startling amount of support on it already. And one of the benefits of joining our Patreon and supporting us on that channel, which we appreciate very much, is that every month or so we will answer your questions. Um, I say or so because we are profoundly busy people, and it's hard to get to everybody's questions, but we try our damnedest, and we're going to do that now. Before we start reading your questions for this month, a couple of brief notes. One, you should like this video. Two, you should comment on this video. Three, you should subscribe to The Skeleton Crew. And four, if you've been subscribed to The Skeleton Crew for a while, or if you just found our channel now, you should consider supporting our Patreon. If you support our Patreon, you will have access to The Skeleton Crewmates Discord server, which is a remarkably... You'll have access to the Skeleton Crewmates, uh, whatever. Okay, I don't give a sh You'll have access to the Discord server. That's what's going to happen, and you're going to like it there. Because our Discord server is a really, really, really supportive, positive community where a lot of people who love prehistoric animals and modern animals and evolution and science and all sorts of manner of things get together and talk about those things. And we talk to you, too. You should support us on Patreon, is what I'm saying, if you can. We appreciate the support very much. Um, if you support us, you will be able to submit questions to our next patron Q&A. Um, without further ado, I'll provide further ado and let you know that I'm Dr. James Napoli, a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. In a continuation of ado, my name is Amelia Zitlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. Whether you a do or you a don't, my name is Scott Johnston, and I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Thank you, Scott. I'm Alex Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at this here Yale University. And if you engage with me on our Patreon Discord, I'll tell you why you, the movies you like aren't as good as one movie about a seagull and two men in a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Hark. A dooby dooby doo. I'm Dalton Meyer, also a PhD candidate at Yale University. And together. Together. We're the skeleton We're the, the skeleton, skeleton crew. crew. That was pretty good. That was actually quite good. <clears throat> um yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna answer some questions now, guys. Um now, just to brief everybody, we've got I think by our account, eight questions to answer, which is really fun. So we'll get through those. It, based on our normal rate of answering questions, this video will be about 19 hours long. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're cognizant of the fact that we talk for a long time about things. We thank Sometimes. you for watching our videos despite it. We, we're always cognizant of it. We can't control it. We're like, you know, are you ever like trying to not eat so much ice cream? And you're thinking about that fact while you're just like halfway through a Ben and Jerry's pint. And you're just thinking, man, I really shouldn't be eating all this ice cream. Is this just viewer, the thing? Viewer, are you familiar with the concept of regret? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like, like three quarters of the way through eating that burger I was describing to you guys tonight. I had more of the feeling of like, I feel like I should be regretting this. I'm not. It was that, like, I mean, listen. That's about, that's the only way to feel after a burger. Oh my god! Yeah, it was. God, do you, were you there for the night of two burgers? Which night of two burgers? The night we went out to Mel's Burger Bar. I'm trying to remember if you were there. Don't it was. So. Oh, okay. It was so it was me and Chris and Nick, and Kalani. I thought you were there, <coughs> but we Sorry. we all got our first burger, and then we finished <laughs> them, and then Kalani and I both looked at each other and said the phrase simultaneously: "I want another burger." And we called the waiter back over and ordered a second enormous hamburger <laughs> and both scarfed them down and then went back to Chris's place to play board games. And I remember just laying back at like a 45 degree angle, just moaning. <laughs> <laughs> like a beached whale. Just like I'm unable why, to you... <laughs> why we have gastrointestinal issues is such a mystery. <laughs> I, I I will just say real fast on the, on the topic of of burgers. Um, 
I think I told did I tell you guys the story of down in Brazil where Peter ate an eight hundred gram <laughs> burger with a side of fries. It, it was five patties in roughly ten <laughs> minutes before I even finished my double. So Peter is one of the the postdocs uh, uh, in the Pierce Lab here at Harvard, and dude's built like a telephone pole, much taller than me, and I've never seen a human being consume as much food as this man. He's great. Ah, he's a shaggy. I love him. He's he's one of my favorite people. It makes me so angry to know that there are people like that who are that skinny. <laughs> when when we were trapped up in Canada um, during the hurricane, he ate twenty eight slices of pizza. I don't think they live as long as most normal folk, though. I'm not going to live that long anyway. Uh, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Anyway, this was a good start. We've already (laughs) derailed ourselves talking about hamburgers for 15 minutes. Let's get to the question. Yes, let's get to them. I'll read off the first one. Um, We're going to start with a very positive one that's aspirational to the future. This comes from Indo05. Mm. who asks, have any of you had a dream discovery you'd hope to find one day? Perhaps it could be something that would add to a hypothesis you agree with or hypothesized yourself, or it could just be something you've always wanted to discover from the start, basically the magnum opus of your career. And I'll I'll open this to Alex first, because that's the first person I looked at. That's a good question. We're going to try to keep our answers concise, but thoughtful. I would say my ideal career discovery would be something I can't even conceive of. Like to encounter something to just like a fossil or something that I I have no conception of right now because no one has had any conception of it. That would be ideal. If not that. Oh, there are too many. I'll, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it with that one. Something something so beyond what's expected that I can't even conceive of it. Okay, Amelia. I think like I in a similar vein of like something that would be really like career changing is something that you know we could not even conceive of. So I'm gonna just pick something that would be very cool and fun, which would be like a beached mosasaur husk from like hell creek ish area like wherever the hell that admonosaur came from that we have at the am and h that's like a husk you know something i Mm. you know i don't i don't really care which taxon because any of them would be cool obviously i have personal preferences but scientifically it doesn't matter and obviously it'd be fantastic if it had a baby because that would just be cool to get a better gauge of like how big the babies were when they were developing how many they had all that kind of jazz but like most importantly it'd be very cool Mm. Dalton. Hmm. You know, <clears throat> I'll also echo that, that I think Alex has summed it up particularly well. Um, that something truly groundbreaking isn't really something that we would foresee discovering right now. There's not like a particular animal that I think would be like supremely. I mean, there's a lot of animals I'd like to find, but there's not like one that stands out. I think what would be incredibly cool to find would be like a very early Jurassic. Lagerstaden of some kind, like something equivalent of like the Yishan or like the Solenhofen, but that's capturing the like early Jurassic transition of small animals, um, would be incredibly important. Yeah, Scott, I would say something that uh, I'm I'm even probably a, a little less uh, biased in terms of taxa than you guys who study specific taxa, but uh, I would love something that is in the ballpark of like, like the, the big mama Cidipati that Amy uh, helped discover and something that is not just like a cool fossil, but is also just gorgeous that I can really that that I can kind of like I, I in a like almost an artistic sense have a bit of a showpiece that like uh I, I when I was looking through my 
photos for uh, a workshop that I ran down in uh, down at Uni Pampa. Um, I remember opining to uh, one of my colleagues that like I'm good at what I do, and I I've done a lot of really cool stuff with fossils. A lot of the fossils I've worked on are not the prettiest things, and I would love to be able to just like like do the Will Smith thing of like this. I did this. And so I guess that this falls to me now. Um, I have a lot of things like this, and I'll just choose two of them, and I'll say them very briefly. One of them would be any productive and high-quality locality in an area or time that is not well sampled. It could be both, but you know we talk about the quality of the fossil record a lot. And I don't even mean in terms of like broad continental scales, but just you know, there are very particular areas where we've got good fossil discoveries. And then there are huge areas where things are much poorer quality. Um, and I would love to just kind of fill in some of the gaps like that. Um, even if it were just finding late Cretaceous stuff in like Texas or Mexico, that is equivalent to what we find in Northern North America, like in Montana, Wyoming, Alberta. The mm -hmm. other one though, and the one that I always kind of dream about is finding the last surviving non-avian dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. because, you know, I think it does really seem that all of the lineages go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, but I think it would be possible for some small Paravian type thing to make it through and just have this little last gasp of dinosaurian life in the earliest, earliest Paleocene, mm -hmm. right? right? As just like a, kind of like the equivalent of a Tuatara, like this dead clade walking that's still around and i i think about that a lot and i i think it would be an incredibly powerful discovery even if it's not that scientifically important just to see this um very evocative last fossil of the small bird-like dinosaur living in a time that had eclipsed it mm -hmm. i think there'd be something very beautiful about that um so i've always hoped one day maybe that'll happen we'll see have to it'd give cool. it a hell of a name Oh, I have one chosen already. <laughs> oh, is it not just like some weird character of its vertebra or something like that? And it's just like, oh, yeah, that's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be place name Asaurus. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So that's, that's the first one. question. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Um, Concise. We did it. Five minutes, five answers. <laughs> Let's do that a couple more times. Um, so we've got another question from Paleo AK92, who asked, uh, something I've been thinking about lately is how poorly fossils are formed in rainforests, acidity, large number of scavengers, etc. This question is likely too speculative, but do you think there were any animals alive during the Mesozoic in these environments that would have exhibited behavior or performed similar roles as contemporary animals alive today in similar environments? Ooh. I mean, I I have an answer to this question, but I I don't know. Go ahead, yours. Um, here's my answer to this question. Yes. Uh, not only do I think that you know there were animals in the rainforest doing uh, things probably similar to to what the animals in today's rainforest do. Um, I don't think it would be exactly the same because the construction of the forest was different. Uh, right, the modern rainforest is kind of this Cenozoic broadleaf forest that emerges um, after the after the asteroid and the Mesozoic forests were different in their composition. But I think if you have dense, closely packed trees and that kind of stuff, similar similar niches are present. Uh, so yes, I think it's almost certain that there are all sorts of fun rainforest uh, Mesozoic creatures, crocs, dinosaurs. Um, no, I, I'd, I'd go even farther to say that's probably where most of their diversity was. <laughs> yep, probably. Never find it. Almost like, certainly. There are rare, there are rare occasions where it looks like what we we get like a, a rainforest or some kind of forest, and something's falling into a lake. Thankfully, uh, there's this great small vertebrate site, and I think, ooh, I don't want to make a fool of my. It's either Kazakhstan or the Czech Republic. Um, that appears to be like a rainforest. Different forest. places. What? 
those are very different places. It's in Europe, right? I think I know the one you're talking about. It's in I thought I thought it was in West uh, Western Asia, but whatever. Mm. But yeah, so it happens sometimes. Uh, that it's the location that I think Char- Share of Opteryx and Longus Squama are from. Oh, oh, then I think never mind. I was thinking of something different. So like when you get these small vertebrate sites, you're just like, what are all of mm-hmm. these things? It's Kyrgyzstan. Um, is and I think longest bomb is from. I, th- I think from like the the lager shotans we have, like uh, like the Ishian stuff. That's not really a rainforest, but that's <clears throat> a forest in, as far as we can tell, lakeside. And there's tons of stuff, and it's weird. So yeah, yeah. I think I think we would be getting some convergence, and also tons of diversity that will never ever. Right now. Paleo AK92 also asked, what is our favorite robot dinosaur? And Alex, what's your favorite robot dinosaur? Tammy and the T-Rex. The T-Rex. Oh, yeah. Fair. This is, I'll do a very brief description. I don't know, because this is maybe something our audience is not aware of. But it's essentially the plot of RoboCop, but a person's brain is put into an animatronic T-Rex. And then... Um, Can I put that in my will? <laughs> sure, uh, and then it's it, it the guy's girlfriend Denise Richards is played by, um, oh fuck, Denise, Denise Richards. Richards. Denise Richards. Denise Richards. Thank you. It is Paul Walker. Uh, has to rescue. By the way, it is oh, Paul Walker. It's, it's Paul yeah, Walker. The human is Paul That's Walker. So Paul, in, this, in this alternate universe, Paul Walker uh, did not meet his ultimate <clears throat> enemy tree. Have we checked <laughs> every animatronic T Rex that exists, though? Maybe like, is it possible he's in one of them? The movie ends, and I need to... It's fun, because he's, he's a big animatronic T-Rex, and he's messing stuff up. But the movie ends with a cyborg orgasm, <laughs> and that's it. A cyborg it's, it's, orgasm, that happens, if you will. And then the credits go. It's a fantastic it's a movie. movie. <laughs> that's my favorite robot dinosaur. Thank you. Okay. okay, Amelia, what's your favorite robot dinosaur? Wow, we're going to shift gears by a lot. Um, the only one that I can think of is that Robo Raptor toy back from God knows when the white one with the big horns because it was really fun and I really had cool. one. I still have one. I know exactly where it is back home. Um, it was cool and it was fun and it was kind of one of the first of like there was that period of whatever the hell that was in the early two thousands where like robot animal things were like the big thing and that was arguably mm-hmm. like the coolest one. Not even argue. No, it was the coolest one. I love that thing. And then they came out with like another one that sucked. It was not as cool. But anyways, I digress. I think I had that one too. I did not. I hated it. Dalton, go so ahead. So Alex took the words right out of my mouth. My favorite robot dinosaur is the T-Rex from Tammy and the T-Rex. Because um, <laughs> Tammy and the T-Rex is awesome. There's like a weird sidekick character to like the scientist who puts the brain in the robot who is who oh, yeah. plays it everyone in the movie kind of plays the movie to different degrees of seriousness and so some people seem to be taking it like as a very serious like drama like oh man what if someone's brain got put in the like robot dinosaur that'd be horrible and then this person's at the other end of the extreme like what if i was in a high school production of frankenstein and i was playing <laughs> igor <laughs> and- <laughs> it's so good Oh, God, that's so fucking... Oh, it's so good. What a good movie. I have a really good one. I think once I mention a couple of you are just going to go like, oh, sh-. Um, The robot Chasmosaurus from Dinotopia. I have no idea what that is. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. It's one of the... Oh, fine. All right, cool. I thought you guys no, I, were... I, I feel you, Scott. ...fans of the deep lore. I feel you. Do you do you know what it is, Dalton? The baby? No. Oh, from wait. the books. Oh, those are the books. Yes, those are very cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh my god, I've never seen this before. Yeah, they, they do the whole like ancient, advanced civilization thing. There, there, there. There's a uh, fine. I'll throw it in the dis- in in our in our chat because no one's seen these. That they have this really really awesome like set of these robotic. Uh, they're called I, I, like strutters or something like that, if memory serves. In the in the book, 
and they're these really really cool robot dinosaurs um that are like used as vehicles by this ancient civilization and like it's super rad there you go it's in the chat is it an ancient civilization of dinosaurs no no they were humans and these were like their vehicles and like they even have like a, a a plot where like the it freaks out like the T-Rexes and the T-Rex like tears the head off of the thing and because it like loses its like visual sensors or whatever it goes on like a rampage around and like acts like it's drunk and stuff like that and like runs into things all the time and stuff it's really cool and it's a fun little plot and it's a really neat design of like the fenestre of the frill being windshields as well like it's rad i it's really cool yeah it's it, cool it's so well done like literally my only complaint with it is that like the head gets ripped off pretty pretty early on when they have it and it's like oh no it looks so much cooler with the head on it but like oh here's another picture of of a version of it that like walking around and stuff. Oh, actually, Alex, you'll love this as well. Uh, there's a bit where it fights a giant um, robot Eurypterid. I do. I do like that. Well, that's incredibly cool. Um, my favorite robot dinosaur. Oh my god, that is very cool. They even have a bit where the giant Eur- Eurypterid fights a T Rex. It's it's. <laughs> rad as hell i'll throw that in the chat as well so while you do that i'll answer this question no 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 no, it's t-rex bites which can be mistaken as bullet holes go on this is very cool so my favorite robot dinosaur is the animatronic t-rex from jurassic park a good choice Uh, boo sorry i i don't really watch a lot of media with robot dinosaurs in them and couldn't even That's say Godzilla. You know, I don't consider dino- like Godzilla a dinosaur in that way. It just it's a movie monster. It's a different thing for me. Um, but I love the animatronic Rex in Jurassic Park, not only for the way that it benefits the movie, but just like watching the behind the scenes footage of it. It really does seem like it's a living animal. Mm-hmm. There's something about its movement, the way they did the skin, the moisture on the skin from the rain. Like it just looks real. It's almost incongruous to see it in the behind the scenes stuff where you can see like the wires and everything coming out the legs because it, it looks like, um, you know, the scenes in the alien franchise where they've got the actor like hooked up to all the prosthetics for the cyborg. And it looks like so remarkably in Congress. That's kind of the way it feels to me. Mm. I think that that animatronic Rex and maybe a lot of the other animatronics they made, but that in particular is one of the greatest achievements in robotics and cinema practical effects. It's amazing that it's not talked about more. Like, it's just stunning, and I love it. Cool. Okay. Next question comes from Ben. Ben asks, what pet theory do you have that is likely not discoverable from fossil evidence? Would you, or, I'm sorry, what pet theory do you have that is not likely discoverable from fossil evidence? Would you like to be true about a prehistoric animal? I can go first if you all want yeah. some time because I've thought yeah, about I want this. Time. Yeah, I real and I've spoken about this before, but I really hope that if you took a Microraptorian dromaeosaur, like Microraptor or Changiraptor or something like that, Cynonithosaurus, and you kind of held it and you pet its belly, I really think that they must have done that thing that cats do, where they like attack you with all four legs and bite the <laughs> out of your hand. <laughs> I think it would be adorable. I really desperately want it to be true. It would obviously never be provable, but it makes me happy to imagine it. So that's mine. That's adorable. I felt genuine. Thank you, Alex. No, yeah, that'd be very cute. I like cats. Is anybody ready? Someone else go. No, I, I, I got a thing. I okay. I have one. I, it's not. I bet if I thought about this longer, I'd think of something different, but there's, it's not really even a hypothesis. It's just kind of a notion, right? And it's overly simplistic, which I recognize, but it's an idea that I like, which is that 
lizards taught dinosaurs to fly, which is something that my advisor has said before. And the idea goes that, like, around the same time we start to see flying or at least semi volant dinosaurs, which is like the late Jurassic, is when we start to see arboreal lizards. And so the idea is that, like, these small theropods are hunting small prey like lizards. And so to escape the dinosaurs, the lizards start climbing trees and living in them. And so that in order to eat, the dinosaurs have to start climbing trees. And when they start climbing trees, then they start having the impetus to start flying around them. It's it's an overly mm-hmm. simplified view, and I mean, even my advisor I think recognizes it's, it's a it's a very broad stroked painting of the history of life, but it's a story that I like. It's a nice story. I say, having tried to write a paper about a similar topic, <laughs> that's a good one. Okay, I guess I guess I have one. Um, I really like the idea that I, I remember talking with James about this a while ago and it's it stuck with me that I love the idea that dinosaurs would have been like essentially that dinosaurs were romantics that like so many birds nowadays are they they mate for life they routinely like essentially reinforce their pair bonds with um dances and like gifts and stuff like that and i love that idea of uh, i love the idea of that being like an ancestral dinosaur characteristic and not just something that birds do that it's like i mean we have that one like trackway of a like mating dance or whatever but um like i've always just like i i remember just like I, I learned that information and I was happy. And I'm like, oh, that's really sweet. And yeah, I'd like that. It, it's also probably right. But like, we'll never know. Like, We'll never know for most species, especially. Like, especially like I could see like, like family, like a, a pair bond of Cytopati coming back and using the same nest year after year after year after year. Right. Right. I mean, and it, I would not be surprised if we had many dinosaurs that made it for life, but um, but I mean, like with almost everything with birds, it probably ha- does have a deeper ancestry. It's very sweet. Yeah. Amelia, you. This leaves me okay. There's, I mean, there's a you. couple of things, and like, thank you. Um, there's a couple of things, and the problem I'm having is like, ah, well, technically that's testable, you know? And I think the one that'll stick with, which is like technically testable, but not really, is like I just want to know what color these things are. Like just broadly, I want to know what was going on and obviously that's never something we'll actually with the like really rare exceptions of like those Lagerstätte little things. Like is it Anchiornis that's got like the little red and the black mm-hmm. and all that? Like that's like an exceptional case, but it's like yeah. what color was Triceratops? Like, were they, you know, like just simple things like that that you know, like unfortunately right. we will never know. And so like I don't know. There's so many, there are so many things that we can never know. <laughs> you know, it's hard to pick just, just one thing, but I guess for, for the purposes of brevity, I'll go with that. I've arrived at my answer. Okay. I I've thought long and hard about this, but I guess my pet hypothesis or I guess intri- the thing I would like to know about the fossil record and the thing I believe but probably will never get an answer for is I believe in my heart that in Earth's past and mostly this is more so directed towards the Mesozoic and then kind of explicitly the Paleozoic the most fucked up thing in the history of Earth lived in the deep sea somewhere <laughs> and was a genuine monster. Like, something bigger than we had any idea anything could be or something just bizarre and just, it's either surviving way after it should be able to, the rest of its clade has gone extinct. Something that any, like, if any person saw off the side of a boat, they would be like, I need to kill myself <laughs> because this can't exist. 
the issue, of course, here, and this kind of almost extends more broadly to like what were deep sea biomes like in the Mesozoic and like past. And the issue being here is that these deep water environments very rarely fossilize. And when they do, subduction <laughs> just grinds them off the face of the earth. So it's it's not really where I'd work. This is not even something so much where I'd work in this area. It's more I want someone to learn about these things and tell me about them. I want to find out there's a 45-foot-long anomalocarid that was, like, blind. <laughs> that was alive in the Carboniferous and would, like, swim up at midnight to, like, grab just some some poor shark and then descend. I'm glad you said like that, that because that's very similar to one of the many things I ran through in my head. It's just like, we will never know what was in the abyss in the Mesozoic or, or yeah. beyond. Like, it's just so sad. Because I'm sure it was horrible. I've, I've oh, also thought God. very frequently of the mountains. Of, yeah. like, just what will... What mountain-adapted groups of... Bigfoots. Anything. But I'm not just it's, relegating this to dinosaurs, but other prehistoric critters as well. It's Bigfoots. It's Yetis. They've been there since the Precambrian. <laughs> they're a separate... They're actually a, a kind a of... A separate blue, origin of They're a blue-green algae. <laughs> they're highly... <laughs> they're married algae. or blue -green. See, like, I, I, now that I said it out loud, I just, like, I just had the thought of, like, what would be a mountain-adapted non-mammalian synapsid? Like, what? Crazy. Yeah, and we'll never uh, know. I nope. believe Skull Island in Natural History answers this exact question. <laughs> it does, actually. <laughs> That's a cool That's book. Cool. I wish it wasn't $600. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that at another point. Um, but let's go on to the next question. This comes from the man with no name, who asks, if you were forced to transform into any non-human animal and live the rest of your life as that animal with your full consciousness and identity, what animal would you choose? I'll, I'll, um, I'll go... You go ahead, Alex. Just the top of my head. Uh, a parrot. Alex, because uh, you want to be able to still crack wise. Long life, I can fly, and I can roast people. I can mimic noises and still make fun of people. Yeah, Alex, you took the thought right out of my head, which is a parrot. <laughs> um, yeah, exact, for the exact reason you said. You can live a long life. Have you ever seen the movie, I think it's called Polly? It's about a parrot that can just talk. It is Because like, you still have your human mind, and you can make human sounds. So you could just talk to people. And then they would realize, oh, this is like a sentient being, and I can they can live in my house and be chill with me and watch TV, and you can eat most of the foods that you still like, like eat a lot of tasty fruit. Yeah, that'd be the best one. But and if someone cooked with nonstick cookware, <laughs> you'd just die. Yeah, just had to tell them to not do that. <laughs> um, yeah. no nonstick. Th this is this is becoming an answer that one of us should have taken because, like, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh. You're, you're correct. Like, some sort of parrot or something. I don't know, maybe maybe a cockatoo? Like, I, I, every once in a while, I really, like, spiritually identify with that one clip of the sulfur-crested cockatoo with, like, the little kid's sippy cup, just, like, screaming into it and then putting it down and then screaming <laughs> into it and then putting it down. <laughs> just listening to the weird echo in there, just, like, standing in the middle of the floor. Um... Like that, or like honestly, it's a bird, a longer lived bird. Um, yeah, that uh, perfect, genuinely. Like, couldn't think of anything else. I I have a different thought. Like maybe a whale. But... This is this is a very good idea. This idea of being a parrot. But consider, I would. I think I'd be be happy to be a crocodile at the Steve Irwin Irwin Zoo. I'd be taken care of. And I wouldn't have to worry about anything, and I can sleep most of the year. And I also still get <laughs> to live a while. And occasionally you get to, like, bite at things, which is great. I have a slightly different answer than everybody, although it's very much along one theme. I'd like to be a kind of large owl, like an eagle owl or a great horned owl. I think if I were forced to transform into a non-human animal, I think I'd err on the side of, I'd like this to kind of be over quickly. <laughs> um, 
mayfly. Like, I don't know. I don't want to live a little bit like a person. I would rather just say, let me just do something that's remarkably different that I would never get to experience and then kind of wrap it up. So I wouldn't want to be an incredibly long-lived bird that could live for centuries, or not centuries, <laughs> decades more, up to a century. Like, how long do you think parrots live? 600-year-old parrot. <laughs> They're millions of year, years old. All parrots that exist are the first parrots that have evolved. <laughs> they have not reproduced. Or died. Um, but I'd like to be an owl, I think, because you get the benefit of senses that you don't get, and that's something that, when I get more existential, I think about. Like, just the fact that almost all groups of vertebrates, except mammals, can see ultraviolet light, and the world looks fundamentally different to them. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, there's a new color. There's a new type of color. Um, there's evidence that birds might be able to visualize the magnetic field of the Earth, like they see mm -hmm. field lines. Somehow. That's insane. I want to experience what it's like to have eyesight like an owl, to see like that at night. I want to experience that kind of hearing perception. I think that would be very cool. So that would be my answer. I'll go with Great Horned Owl. I also, I, I do have to say, I really appreciate that uh, you you are confronted with the idea of, oh my God, that there are colors out there that I cannot see or comprehend. And you're just like, wow, that sounds really cool. Instead of writing a short story about it. You, you mean a really <laughs> racist short story about it? The color out of space <laughs> is not racist. Oh, I just assumed it was because it was love. <laughs> not, not as much. No, it's, I mean, it complains more. It's more, it's actually kind of about white trash a little bit, but it's just classist. It is classist. And everyone miss. Oh God, I'm, I'm not going to launch into a, why everyone is dumb and thinks that they're very smart about. Oh, a color I I can't understand. Never mind. I'm not okay. Change so much. I also before we get off of this, I thought it, depending on my mood, I 99% of the time I'd want to be a parrot, but there's one percent of the time where I would like to be that. Uh, that fungal super colony that's like under how many square miles of Australia. And I think with a human intellect, I could do something interesting with that. <laughs> so we got a question from Frank and Trotsky who asks, what are your favorite species of lizards, including amphisbenians or snakes? Amelia, you start. No, that's hard. Oh my God. Lizards, plural. I think, Favorite implies just choose one. Sure. Well, that's impossible. of all lizards. That's impossible. I can't do that. I like different ones for. Different it's not ideas. Mosasaurus or Tylosaurus. No, I thought it was. Can I, I? I. If I. No, no, no. It's it's it, well. It, he's. They say all lizards, including amphisbenians and snakes. So if they're being that inclusive, I think, and we're a paleontology channel, I think that we can. Well, duh, yeah, but I feel like the spirit that. of the question is broader than that. Obviously, it would be Tylosaurus, but even you, after you want that, me to, I, I got one. I'm the delay. I'm gonna reread the question. And I'll just open with Alex. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we have a question from Frank and Trotsky, who asks, "What are your favorite species of lizards, including amphisbenians and snakes?" Alex, why don't you start? This is an easy question. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, my favorite species of lizard, and this might be what uh, the kids consider basic, <laughs> my goodness, um, but there is only one lizard that I have considered book, like creating an entire vacation and trip around, and that is the Komodo dragon. It's the biggest one. It's a big monster. They swim, and I want to see one in the wild. Really, 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 really bad. That's my answer. No, 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 no. What, 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 what? Oh, okay, well, quiet. Yeah, it was, it was a lull. It was not a... Okay, sorry. The, I couldn't hear and I panicked. <laughs> That's okay. my answer. Komodo dragon. Dalton, how Komodo about dragon's you? dragon's a good answer. It's not, it's not going to be my answer, but it, my, it's definitely up there for me. It's a really amazing lizard. Um, no, I'm going to say that my fave... In trying to pick a single species of lizard, which is tricky, a lot of great lizards, and I do love them all for various reasons. My favorite species of lizard is Abronia graminea, which is the arboreal alligator lizard. Um, they are extremely mm. cool-looking lizards. 
and they come in like this beautiful blue and green color. Um, they're gorgeous. They're very cool. Uh, they're near and dear to a particular study area that I'm working on. There's a lot. They got a lot going for them. They're my favorite. Amelia. Um, sorry, I don't want to. Are people waiting for? Okay, we're waiting Sorry. for you now. Just I, I forgot the one the the it, one of the entire reasons I said Komodo dragon. <laughs> yeah, go. Uh, it's because they're they're the lizard species that is trying their hardest to become an archosaur, <laughs> a good god fearing archosaur. <laughs> My bit is done. Thank you. Um. Okay. So this is obviously a very difficult question for me because I like lizards also quite a bit. Um. If God damn it, um, I'm gonna cheat. I'm not going to pick one, but I'm going to be quick. Obviously, for extinct things, Tylosaurus is the best thing. No contest. Um, living lizards, I like different kinds for different reasons. Komodo dragons kick ass, and they're very cool, and I do like them a lot. But like other monitors, are also gorgeous and fun in their own ways. And I have a soft spot for leopard geckos because I've had one for almost ten years now, and he is wonderful. Scott? Mm, if I had to choose, like, I, my mind went to, like, tegus, like, Argentine black and white tegus for a minute, but if I'm really talking about, like, one that, like, seeing one in the wild would just, like, absolutely blow my mind, Draco lizards. Oh. Those are great. Oh, yeah. They're so cool. They're so pretty. Like, ah, oh, gorgeous. I uh... love them. I have a story about Draco that I'd like us to cut. So my answer is obviously Varana Salvadorii, the crocodile monitor. That was up there for me, too. It, it is one of the most incredible animals. What I like about it is that it's about as large as a Komodo dragon. Like, they're, they're almost as big, and their tail is proportionally longer. And because of their range and ecological habit, we know very little about them. Um, they are mostly arboreal. They are eight foot long arboreal monitor lizards that are extremely active and are reported to hunt birds by leaping between treetops. That's um, so cool. They have proportionally some of the longest teeth of any like animal I've ever seen. These long blade like partially serrated teeth. Um, their whole maxilla is like arched up to accommodate a huge volume of food. Um, I've seen pictures of people who've been bitten by their pet crocodile monitors um gnarly these things rip right through flesh they really remind me of what what a lot of uh theropods probably would have been like because their teeth have some similar functional traits um these are animals that are designed to rip through meat not bite it and i think that that's a very cool thing um they are also um described by locals in new guinea as evil spirits that climb trees walk upright breathe fire and that's kill bad men. same and uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They're very, very cool. Um, amazing animals. I There was a time in my PhD that I really thought I was going to have to go out into the jungles of Papua New Guinea and just try to observe them in the wild to work on a paper I was working on. And instead, I gave up on the paper because I'm afraid of them. And I don't um, want to encounter them in the wild. Are they the ones that look like they have kind of a crude unidirectional airflow through their parabronchi? Um, well, they use a gular, a positive pressure gular pump to overcome carrier's constraint, but all monitors do that, as far as I know. There was uh, there was one where like a, a flow through model was done for like their lungs. Um, I think that was Veranda Salvatore. Yeah, okay, that maybe. would make sense. I can't remember which, which is the called. Asian yeah. water monitor. Yeah, yeah. I also I want to interject very. Um, yeah, Salvatore. Sorry. Is cool. Um. J- Finish with this, and then I have something to say about a, diff- a different but related thing. That's fine. Um, it's just they're very rare in museum collections, also because they're so rare to find. So the AM&H, which has a one of, if not the largest herpetology collection in the world, certainly one of the largest, has one specimen or one osteo specimen. Then there's a preserved skin, which might be from the same individual. Um, so it's like you know you go through all these cabinets of iguanas and komodo dragons and everything and there's just this one skull and that's all the information you get it's 
it's cool. Also, uh, the unidirectional airflow is observed in the Savannah monitor. Uh, the x the matter. Uh, Savannah uh, monitor. Okay, thanks. And to to wrap up the lizard conversation briefly, because none of us none of us chose a snake, which I think is sad and not fair. So I will also add that I really, really, really like green anacondas because they're really dorky looking, but also they're just kind of cool because they're huge. Um, and mm -hmm. also rhino vipers and gaboon vipers, which look they look like an animal that should be able to be pet. I don't know why, but they just do. They're I love them. They're very cute. I get that. King Cobras, too. I mean, any, like, a venomous snake that, like, rears up, like, four or five feet. Yeah. And kills a lot of people due to proximity. That's that's a scary snake. I like that. To go back to fossil ones real quick for just a second, that one giant uh, sea snake, that's name I forget, Titanophis or whatever? Gigantophis. Right, yes. Gigantophis. That thing's cool. My favorite thing about King Cobras is that one of them was loose in the New York City subway system for a while. I um, remember following that story very closely. Yes, that's what you have to do. Because uh, well, it was kind I of it escaped from its enclosure. I'm sorry? I was just kind of like super excited that there was a big snake in New York. <laughs> I, I think it was before it was before I lived there. I think. Um, but it, I think it escaped from the Bronx Zoo and it was found in the subway tunnels, which is so ludicrous, given it didn't kill anyone, which is wonderful, I guess, for the people yeah. who weren't killed. But imagining how many drunk people like go home on the subway late at night. I'm amazed that nobody was killed by this animal. It, it's it's insane. Yeah. Anyway, we should probably yeah. move on. Okay. Polar Blizzard 01 asks, what dinosaur or extinct animal do you think deserves more attention and wish would be more popular? I'll start with Scott. Um, I would say that, honestly, there's a lot of Permian stuff. The uh, Permian and Triassic stuff that I don't think gets anywhere near the pop culture representation that I think it. Uh, uh, let me just okay, I'll I'll narrow it down to uh, Rawasukians. I think that there need to be more Rawasukians in things. Like they're already kind of like a, a, like people know, at least like people who know paleo things like know Postasuchus from walking with dinosaurs and stuff, but they're just so interesting. Some of those like early like dinosaur mimic crocodilomorphs are just so rad. Crocodiliforms? What are they? Well, you're going in the wrong direction. Um Pseudosuchian is, is probably Pseudo the safest. Uh paracrocodilomorphs, if you want if we want to get okay. fancy. But But yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. They're, those are and, yeah. Very cool. Uh, if I want to give a very short mammal answer, um, uh, Calicotheres. I love Calicotheres, and they need to be in more things. Dalton. Oh, bollocks. Um, it's hard for me to, to think, because like, I, I don't know, I spend a lot of time, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> however you want to, to look at it, in kind of like the online paleo sphere. And so it's harder to figure out kind of what's popular versus not popular because like mm -hmm. people hyper fixate on various things in in that uh, that realm that I, I'm a, a I'm surprised about like oh people people are interested in that um, I think deserves more attention. Man, it's really tricky. This is a hard one. Um, mm -hmm. Can I request more time to think about it? If someone else has an answer, you can. I'll I'll move on to Amelia. I there's a couple that I could say, and I think the one. Well, I'll I'll say two, kind of for the same reason. I will say ammonites and trilobites because, like, mm -hmm. at least again among we're I'm assuming we're talking among. The, like the general public, like just general interest, not research interest, because I think 
those animals do quite do get quite a lot. They could get more, absolutely, but um, it's just I think about every now and then how both ammonites and trilobites are like literally symbols of paleontology, and yet there's not much media focus on them. There's not much like if you give you know a paleontology presentation to a bunch of kids, like it's rare that you get someone who says that they really like ammonites or they really like trilobites. And like, they're such great examples of like weirdo alien animals that we don't really have around today. Like they look like things that we have today, but they're so fundamentally different that they're a little hard to comprehend. Um, Especially trilobites being so old and so weird and diverse. And wasn't there, I, I might be wrong and dumb, but aren't they one of the groups of animals that we think like, evolved vision completely differently from everybody else like for you know the umpteenth time or am i mistaken is it just like trilobites trilobites um i know there's something up with their eyes i just don't remember what it is exactly so yeah they have kind of cool like these mineral like like i think quartz lenses yeah like I, I think the earliest ones do Yeah. Um, no, it's fine. It's it's irrelevant. Like, the point is just, like, they're extremely cool, and they're doing important, weird things. And, like, ammonites, like, it's really easy to just think of them as nautiloids, but they're not. <laughs> like, they're their own weird thing that we just don't have anymore. And they're so common. And, like I said, like, they're right. literally, the two of them are symbols of paleontology. And yet, I was thinking about it the other day, because I was just thinking about uh prehistoric planet in the the ammonite sequence in the second episode that like i just really like that they actually got attention like and that it was good and well informed and there was like a variety of them because there are a variety of them um i don't know they feel just kind of taken for granted i guess yeah i'm gonna swoop in with a knight of pedantry moment just to clarify that trilobite eyes are made of calcite not quartz calcite thank you knight of pedantry Alex, what about you? Well, 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 there are a few areas I think could that use a bit of work. Obviously, everyone should realize and worship how cool early diversion crocodilomorphs are. Because they're rad, and Scott's correct. Uh, Sudosukian supremacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, some of the, like, Dos Welids, uh, some of those weird archosauroforms are bizarre and fascinating. And then even getting like farther outside of that, I, I, I think temnospondyls mm. um, and, and like Devonian tetrapods are fascinating. And it's, I, I'm always just shocked to find out like how, how few people are actively re- like there are people working on it and doing really cool stuff, but there's just so much material that I feel like it'd be ripe for the pluck the the plucking of exciting papers and discoveries yeah you should see some of the fun things i'm prepping they're a blast you're very quiet but i'll take your word for it you should see some of the fun things i'm prepping oh my god <laughs> Hot dog. all right dalton have you have yeah you decided- i have and i'm i think gonna uncharacteristically say not a reptile Although I will give, a, I'm going to throw a bone to Japanosaurs. I think, I think they could yep. have yep. big yep. pop culture um, good times. I think they'd be they'd be a fan favorite of the non like, and they've been no paleo involved depictions of them, um, if memory serves. Yeah, I think I'm I'm a little spoiled be. because like I know so many people who research Triassic reptiles, and so like all of these things kind of come to my mind like, oh yeah, Trypanosaurs, of course, but like, yeah, in the public eye, Trypanosaurs and a lot of the weird Triassic reptiles, I think, are deserving of like a whole documentary series and pop culture depiction. Um, but also, to that end, I think that there is like a beyond like maybe one or two episodes of like Walking with Beasts, like a lot of Oligocene mammals I think need, could, would, would be due for more public appreciation and and things not just like entelodonts, which are cool and kind of scary, but like the more kind of like oreodonts should there should be plush oreodonts all over because they're basically like the way I describe them to anyone. And oreodonts are a group of um, herbivorous mammals. Is basically if you asked a child to draw a herbivore, like 
a four or five year old, like draw, draw an animal that eats plants and they're going to accidentally draw an Oreodon because they're just kind of, they're kind of like the things that Anakin <laughs> jumps on on Naboo. They're just round, <laughs> um, just kind Big of generic herbivores. Shape. Yeah. They are very animal shaped. Mark one mod zero herbivore. Um, and so there's like a lot of stuff like that in the Oligocene that is interesting because it's reflecting a time of like big climate change on Earth. Um, it's familiar enough that I think people like I think the public would be could latch onto them easily as as things they could recognize. And there just hasn't been much uh, hasn't been much to do about them. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm looking at Oreodonts. And I love them. Um, I mean, and they're profoundly like they're incredibly yeah, common. Diverse. Like, like yeah. Like, Dalton and I went for so... a little hike for maybe like ten minutes when we were on a road trip. God knows how long ago, and we found we just found mm-hmm. one, like a jaw and some other yeah. In, Talk... in, uh, the... in Badlands National Park. Yeah. Talk to almost any museum out west, and they'll be like, like. Welcome. You know how the a and has the big bone room? Like, I know places that have, this is the Oreodon chamber. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> it's like, this is just, this is where all of them are. We, we, we needed to expand to a new facility to fit all these Oreodons. It's like that meme of the guy with the limes, except they're Oreodon <laughs> skulls. I think they would have been great pets. It's, it's really a shame they're extinct. Yeah. It's a damn shame. Um. Okay, I realize it's my turn to answer this question. I've got a very simple uh, answer, but I think it's one I think about a lot. Real Dilophosaurus. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I, I yes. I think about this not in terms of like an entire group that I think needs more attention, but just like what's an untapped potential of a very cool looking animal that would be scary? Like Dilophosaurus is about two meters, six feet tall, 20 feet long, five, six meters long, right? It's a cool animal. It's big. It's got a cool, like, you know, hook in its jaw. Big, straight teeth. I think that a realistic Dilophosaurus would be a very cool movie monster. And I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't happened. You, so, know, you know the closest one to it? What's that? The Dilophosaurus in the fucking, like, 2008 Tarot game. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. No, you're right. Yeah. No, that's great. What about so, when dinosaurs you know, around America? Well, like, well, it, I'm not saying it's never appeared, but I'm saying, like, in it would be a realistic Dilophosaurus would be a very good antagonist in, like, a movie sure. about dinosaurs. I see. Right. Um, it would be something that could be popular in a non-Jurassic Park-ified way. I, I'm surprised that nobody's ever kind of gone for it. Is um, that because it is living in the shadow of the Jurassic Park one, perhaps? I think that's a little bit it. Almost every depiction of Dilophosaurus that I have seen in media that isn't trying to be specifically scientifically correct is venomous Mm -hmm. and small. Right. So we've got, I think, only two more questions. Wow. So I'm going to read one. This one comes from Max Ironpaw who says theropods, for example, T-Rex, appear front-heavy in terms of their apparent weight distribution. It appears that their tails would need to be massively heavy to counterbalance mass forward of the hip. More so, that significantly heavy prey could be cantilevered out front. Has center of mass and center of gravity been determined for these animals to ensure that their physical representations are correct? Um, The short answer is yes. Um, One thing that's worth keeping in mind with theropod dinosaur anatomy is that despite the fact that there seems to be much more animal in front, these animals had huge lungs, which are huge regions of essentially, you know, air density and would have had a lot of their bones invaded with air sacs. So a lot of their volume is not filled with, with animal parts. It's not flesh or blood or bone. It's literally air. So the density of the front half of the animal is quite a bit lower than you would expect. And this is actually something that we see convergently happen in a lot of large groups of therap or groups of large theropod, I should say. Um, tyrannosaurs, carcharodontosaurs, these large theropod groups get increasingly pneumatic skulls. So huge sex- sections of their skull are being excavated by their cranial sinuses. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition, they tend to have a lot of 
airspace in the vertebrae. So it does seem that maintaining this sort of lightness of the front half of the skeleton is something that was important for the animals. It's also worth noting that it's rare for the tail to have pneumatic spaces. Um, there are some groups of theropod that do that, but it does seem that the tail was very massively built. Um, and we know that not only did it not have a lot of air in it, uh, the tail muscles were quite large as well. The large caudofemoralis muscle extends backward from the femur onto the tail. So the tail would have been quite a bit more bulky than it's normally shown. In conjunction with a very light front of the skeleton, it does seem that they were balanced pretty well. And the center of gravity does appear to have been right over the hips, like you'd expect. Um, when carrying prey, to address that part of your question, it, it is very likely that the animal would have elevated its front half a little bit to maintain the center of gravity over the feet, or else it would tip over. So they probably would have picked something up and elevated into something that might have even gotten close to the traditional upright dinosaur depiction that was popular for most of the 20th century. They couldn't have gotten quite there, but they would have definitely hiked up quite a lot to maintain their center of gravity. Anybody have anything they want to add, or is that... No, I think that's a pretty satisfactory... Yeah. Okay. Oh, God. Well, then we've uh, saved... The sinuses and stuff, which was what I was... Did you mention um, the caudofemoralis muscles at all? I imagine, like, with with so much... Okay. I did. I kind of spaced out, so... That's fine. (laughs) No, just full disclosure, sorry. (laughs) No, 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 it's fine. I, I don't care. Um... And so now we've saved the question we're likely to have the longest answer to for last. Um, and this is a question from Wheat, who asks, if you each had the ability to do the Jurassic World trilogy in your vision, how would it go? Um, I was about to make a snippy joke about Alex's webcam, but it refocused before I could do so. Because um, it had it had defocused, and I would have said I filmed the entire movie franchise with Alex's <laughs> webcam, so you couldn't see any of it. Um, I'm going to just give my answer first here because it is something we talked about a little bit in the Indominus Rex review that we did during our charity live scream live scream I say this is an insight into the mental state Um, live stream back in June I think that this movie franchise to work needs to make you feel bad for the dinosaur and needs to do a slightly smarter engagement with what genetic engineering really means, if that's going to be the ethos of the franchise. If it's about making monsters, I want to see genetic manipulation and the way that DNA works worked into the plot in a way that's a little bit more intelligent, but also far more creative than what they ultimately did. Like, just saying you're doing genetic modification, so you mix and match traits of different animals, is such a surface-level way to deal with it. It's the thing that I like about the Locust plotline in Jurassic World Dominion, that it's exploring ideas of how would a large corporation use this to maximize profit, potentially at expense of the rest of the world. It's kind of a silly way to do it, but, you know, talk about the way that DNA can recombine. Talk about the fact that viral genomes can be integrated into, you know, into vertebrate DNA. A large part of our DNA is viral in origin. Or it's, you know, there's... I guess viruses really have RNA, but we get a lot of their, our genome comes from them. And retroviruses wind up integrating into the genome. Like, you don't have to go super down into the weeds to have really, really interesting plots that can develop. And I think it's it would only benefit the films if they did that. Alternatively, if they want to be, oh, we're so bad, we're playing God, we're creating these animals that shouldn't be created, you also can't villainize the animals. Like, I think Alex is the one who said it during the live stream, but like, Frankenstein only works because you feel bad for the monster. You know, it, it's, it kind of doesn't work when you have the scientists hand-wringing over this terrible thing they created with Indominus Rex. But then it's also super fun to watch Indominus Rex get teamed up on by two separate dinosaurs and then eaten by a mosasaur. It, it, it undermines the entire ethos of the film. So I think you could do both of those things, you could do one of those things, but that's the ultimate guideline I would give to the franchise, to not get into a long series of minute little line edits that, you, that I would make to the films. So that's my answer. I've got, if, if I don't want to jump on anyone, but I gotta, 
I got a pitch. Go for it. Go ahead. Here's my pitch. You don't make them at all. <laughs> Legacy sequels suck my balls. No, I'm kidding. That's incredibly cynical and not productive. I do have a thought for how I would do it. That's not that. Here, here it is, kings, kings and queens. Um, you pick up kind of with what the books are implying are happening all throughout the original Jurassic Park, because we're going to call it Jurassic World. That's the name of the, of the trilogy. And you start, the first Jurassic World film is through like illegal, maybe collecting, or they're sneaking onto boats, stuff like that. Dinosaurs are entering the mainland. The first movie is a return to roots, straightforward survival horror film with a cast of fun characters, but it is with dinosaurs now in on the mainland and like three species max. The second, so that one ends and it's like, holy shit, they're coming here in, in droves. The second one is years, like several years after. Now we have the Jurassic World. Now there are extinct species everywhere. People are like taking the genes, editing them, either making them more realistic, I don't really care, it, or, or a hybrid. Again, this is not my interest in the series. But the second film is, what does a Jurassic World look like? And I think there's a lot of room here to explore some fun themes. Um, but also, kind of like the best part, my favorite part of Dominion is the Malta sequence where there's, like, a black market. And I'm like, this is very surface level, but it's, like, fun and cool, and, like, kind of wish this was the rest of the movie. But stuff like that. Um, I don't know how, how you streamline that into, a, like, a cohesive narrative, but uh, kind of maybe globe-trotting a bit. I'm thinking it kind of in the vein of World War Z if it were a little better. And then three, the final film is is the resolution of what to do with this Jurassic world. Are, are, do we try to facilitate the modern world and its ecosystems with extinct creatures, or do we explore the Lysine contingency? Hmm. That's it. That's, that's, that it's, it's not particularly heady or thoughtful. It's fun monster. It's the first one spooky, and the other two are kind of globe-trotting prehistoric monster adventure movies. Um, but basically taking what Dominion did and just throwing that shit in the first one. Like, the ending of, of Fallen Kingdom is the first movie, and then the rest of it is... Yeah, that, that's, that's my idea. So, that's a good idea. I just want to make one addendum to what I said before, because my girlfriend studies viruses right now, and if I say a wrong thing about them, I'll never hear the end. <laughs> So I need to correct what I said. Um, specifically with like viral DNA being integrated into our own genomes, that's something that retroviruses do. Like that's how they work. They insert a DNA copy of their viral RNA into the host genome to make it replicate that RNA. Um, I think there are very interesting movie concepts in there, probably not for a Jurassic Park film. But the idea of like, you know, if you really wanted to weaponize something that's how you would do it with a retrovirus. You wouldn't, for instance, use an mRNA vaccine. <laughs> um, that would be stupid. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That would be the dumbest way to do it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you know, it, that's just an addendum to correct what I said. Not all viruses are injecting their uh, DNA copies of their RNA into you, but retroviruses do it a lot. And there's enough retroviral DNA in vertebrate DNA right now that we know that they've been doing it like for about 450 million years. Like this is a very, very long-term process and a lot of vertebrate genomes are of retroviral origin. Kind of fucked up. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Anyway, who wants to go next? I can go. Unless um, Amelia, do you have your idea of pressing? I mean, it's not pressing, but I'll go. Cause I think mine will be a little bit quicker <laughs> just cause like, it's okay. not, this is this is sure. not a kind of, like a thought that I explore very often. Um, also, Scott, sorry, I just ignored you. I forgot. I thought you had done it already. That was a brain fart on my end. Um. So, I think like I 
agree with a lot of what's been said already. Like, I would really, like, the thing about Fallen Kingdom that I wish, which, like, I think Fallen Kingdom kind of has the elements that set, that would have set up Dominion better, and that also should have been executed better. Like, I wish Fallen Kingdom was more straight horror, because, like, there is so much potential for, like, not even, like, I was thinking, like, a found footage style thing would be kind of fun. Like, I guess this isn't really Fallen Kingdom, but, like, like Battle at Big Rock. Like, that idea of people are just kind of hanging out and they don't quite know what's going on yet. And it's really not, like, for most of that short, like, the people are just kind of there. It's not really, you know, the focus. It's like the, the animals are doing their own thing, as animals do. Um, but I think really leaning into, like, straight horror of what it would actually mean if these kinds of animals were actually around. And then the other side of it, which Alex kind of touched on with the little black market thing in Dominion, like, that, like, I agree, like, that was, it's realistic in the way that it's like, yeah, if there were these cool, weird animals, like, absolutely these kinds of things would happen in back alleys. And, like, Fallen Kingdom touches on it a little bit, too, with, like, the, the military auction thing happening at the end. It's like, yeah, I could see something like that happening. Like, it's stupid, but, like, and I, it wouldn't even be necessarily military bidding on it, but I could see, like, labs bidding on these things to, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I think the the biggest problem I have with Jurassic World movies is that they have threads of all of these good ideas, and they just don't, don't go anywhere good with them. Because it's too... I don't know if... It's, it's like pop music, right? It's just, like, appealing to the general audience. But it's not always necessarily that good. It's good enough, which is like a shame because like, as was shown in the original movie, there's a lot of potential with the idea. People like dinosaurs. It's easy to make a good movie about them as long as you just make a good movie and put them in it. <laughs> like, you know, so. Yeah, that's that's about all the development that I've yeah. done with my no, idea. Is, yeah. I have several ideas for what I would like to do with it. Uh, my least kind of, uh, I don't want to say realistic, that's not really the right word. My least viable idea is I would just like a modern Marvels type two hour movie about the workings of a functional Jurassic Park and to just be able to sit and watch be like, this is how we do all the enclosures and this is what feeding time is like. And this is the veterinary care section. Whatever. That would be my dream movie is, is a movie that no one would watch and would make no money. Uh, to make these movies into movies people would watch and would, would make would make money, is I would do, I, I think Jurassic World had a, had a cool idea of a functioning park and, and kind of returning to that. Like, it's, there's, there's a kind of classic sense of, like, hubris of, oh, we're, we have control this time, we're going to do it again. That's a classic Jurassic message. And what I would do is take the, the, some of the best parts like, if you divorce it from the dinosaurs, right, Jurassic Park to a, a decently functional but lesser extent The Lost World and to a, a decently functional and maybe greater extent Jurassic Park 3, the, the non-dinosaurian threadline of them is kind of what Alex mentioned. It's like survival horror, survival, survival thriller. They are they're survivor movies where it's like you care about these characters and you want them to get through a tough situation. And I think we characterize the new trilogy instead of in that vein, we maintain the kind of playing with technology that we shouldn't and, and forces of nature that we shouldn't. We take the hubris of man and we merge it with something that's becoming more popular in cinema now, which is kind of uh, stories more about uh, like corporate espionage and, and kind of high, high finance movies in the veins of like Big Short um, to like, uh, some extent like Oppenheimer where it's, it's a lot of kind of procedural um, bureaucratic things. And so you have a working park where it's probably a new, a new company. And, and this is, we can introduce like more paleo accurate dinosaurs at this point. Cause they're, they're doing their DNA thing a little bit different. So it's like the dinosaurs are different. It's the same idea. We've got a zoo. There are other companies vying to get this. And it's all like from the scraps of InGen's patents that are held up in various like legal mumbo jumbo. And so people are kind of working together to try and put together Jurassic Park from the scraps. And one company has succeeded in doing it, and they've made this zoo. And other companies are trying to to get a hold of this. And it, I mean, I don't want to remake Jurassic Park, right? But we're kind of in that vein. Like, you're sending people to the island 
to do to do espionage or to do sabotage. But the consequences are less felt in terms of some big disaster. Like we see, the, like we see several like brinks of disaster, but the park itself doesn't fail because I think it's important to kind of keep it as a through line throughout the rest of the movie movies. But you see people introducing the idea of like, oh, we've recreated dinosaurs with a different method, and then you can have like, oh, we've got like Jurassic Park Velociraptors, and and as more and more companies kind of slowly put together the pieces of the puzzle of how do we make dinosaurs then you start having, you can introduce several things. One, you can introduce all kinds of new species and all kinds of new weird designs because people keep bringing it up in different ways, right? And so you can sell a lot of toys. Uh, but B, you can incorporate the thing, like Alex said, that I like, and Amelia, that I like from uh, Fallen Kingdom or from Dominion a lot, which is like the black market scene. And so you, you start to get like lots of little fires. And the movie is about like how do the people in charge try to put all these like little dinosaur fires out and like stop a Jurassic world scenario from happening because I can't think of a movie in which dinosaurs like become a part of the modern ecosystem in a believable in like, in a in a way that I could like buy it. Cause I'm just like, we just kill them all, but I can see a, how do, how does like an overstressed underfunded, like division of people deal with all of these problems created by companies behaving badly. I find it amazing that when they were writing the sequel trilogy for Jurassic Park, they really skipped on what was probably the best individual movie that happened in there, which is the initial response to dinosaurs becoming loose in North America. Like like Amelia said, I think Battle of Big Rock was in, in some ways the best that it ever got in terms of like there was a real immediacy to that thing. Like, it, it felt like this is an emergent situation that is frightening and unlike anything mm -hmm. we've dealt with before. And all of that potentially interesting movie time that could have probably been the second movie if they'd wanted it to be is just the 30-second newsreel at the beginning of Dominion before they get into a much less interesting story. Anyway, sorry, Scott, you go ahead now. So, I'm going to go a, a, a little avant-garde with this in that um i wouldn't make a trilogy uh i would make either entirely unconnected or barely connected movies uh that tell that tell small stories in the jurassic universe like honestly um not to kind of crib parts of kind of all of your stories but I would actually love a it, it it's a through line in the book that I thought was not not even a through line. It's a plot point in the book uh, that I love and I'm very sad we didn't really get a chance to see it on the big screen. Uh, if we had a movie that was about like the like small town like nurses and stuff whatever in costa rica that have like the there are dinosaurs there and they're figuring out what the is going on and no one's talking about it. that kind of like that like not even like that's corporate chapter. espionage what that's the yeah. first chapter right yeah not even like a corporate espionage sort of thing but more of like a corporate like like almost like oh god what's what's that like like black water or something that mark ruffalo <laughs> movie just, dark I'm water looking it up. dark water I yeah think. where it's like we're realizing that like corporation behaving badly sort of thing of just like we are realizing things that we didn't even really know were going on and especially with the added thing of like these are dinosaurs like this is a like, this is something that no one would believe unless you, like, got them a body and was like, this ate a child in, uh, like, in our hospital. So something like that I would love. Like, uh, basically, I'm thinking of, I also, I'm going to cop out even more of, I've only thought of two of these. It's late, and I can't think of a third one. But, um, but basically, like, my dream Jurassic Park sequels don't really sell themselves on being Jurassic Park sequels. That it'd be like, this is like this is a story about like a nurse and some people in this small rural like town trying to figure out what the hell is killing people, what the hell is going on here. 
Uh, and then uh, one that I think I've mentioned before of like uh, a story of like some uh, thrill seekers or like, uh, or even better, like some like working fishermen or something accidentally being uh, becoming shipwrecked on Isla, uh, on Isla Sorna and trying and like having it be like of the gray or the, or uh castaway style survival movie that they slowly realize that, holy shit, there are dinosaurs here. This is the old, uh, hey, remember that old theme park that used to be a thing for a little bit? Oh my God, what's been happening here? We're trapped here sort of thing. Uh, like leaning into the more intrigue or survival horror aspects of it. And I cannot think of a third. Uh, I thought Ooh. of two that I would really like, but that's it. Scott, I'm going to build on your little, I'm going to build on your little, on your little idea right there. Here's a million dollar movie idea. Yeah. A billion dollar movie. I like the idea of the shipwreck uh, fisherman, right on on Isla Nublar or whatever. Ready for it? Yeah. Here, here's the twist. They are shipwrecked by the storm that lock, blocks the island off. It is it is a movie that is basically happen, happening on another part of the island, and they have no f- clue why there That's are dinosaurs. Cool. But mm-hmm. we, the yeah. audience, recognize yeah. like. Oh holy shit! They washed into they they they're fucking stranded on you know the south side of Isla Nublar, and we get like Herrerasaurus so, or some Metriacanthosaurus. Alex, and I'm sure you're aware of this. What you have just created is the Telltale Jurassic Park game, but with characters who are more yes. less aware of what's going on. Yes, which is a great idea. Really? Yeah, that's what the, the game yeah. is. Yeah. I, I oh, remember, it's a I fun. It's a good game, and it's a cool story. It's 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 the events of Jurassic Park, but happening to other characters. On the island, it's also based See, uh, on yeah, the well, plot of the I'll, first season of Camp Cretaceous. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say full disclosure that yeah, like the the, re- the reason why I've said like it's a years later thing and uh, it, it is mostly so one we can have some more like accurate dinosaur designs. I think that would be super cool, especially like I've always had. Uh, and also we could have like a fun reveal later on of where they actually are of like, like going into the interior of the Island, like, like moving, like slowly finding like uh, buildings and stuff like that. And they stumble upon a gift shop or something like that. And like dawning horrors, they pick up a Jurassic park thing and it's just like, ah, sh-. and also with like more accurate animals. I, I've also had the, the thought in my mind for a while of like, uh, up on top of like a, like a decrepit building or like climb up a tree or something like that. And there, and there's like temporary like safety up there as like, it jumps up and like snaps at them. Like, like a Raptor jumps up and snaps on like that one scene in Jurassic park three. And then it like backs off, looks at the tree, cocks its head and then runs up the tree with wing assisted inclined running as they all freak the fuck out. <laughs> I, right. I, I think that, Oh, I was just going to say, sorry, Oops. James. This discussion has That's inspired fine. in me. I actually think the best direction to take the Jurassic Park, like not dinosaurs as a whole, but the Jurassic Park franchise, I think a very smart direction to take it, and one that is not particularly profitable because these movies aren't really shown in theaters that much, is in VHS style anthology of like shorter stories. Ooh. Yes, because like yeah, yeah like, like Battle of Big, Big Rock, you include several of those, and I think I think. What the, what the movies the, like? What the previous films have set up is more suitable for like that kind of venue, right? I I think that one thing that they would have to do though is, and I I promise I won't say anything else after this because is, they have to get good. I think that it's important for sequels to understand thematically what is driving the prior movies in a franchise. Because I think that's how you get sequels that feel like they're connected. And, like, it's one thing I always say about the Marvel movies, right? The Marvel movies are, to a large extent, I would argue, fairly weakly written. But they tend to have the correct thematic underpinnings to feel like there's much more substance there than there is. Because there's something that's well thought out. I know I've talked with Scott about this, but, like, case in point, Tony Stark, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark, is essentially a character who's whole idea is that he's grappling with his past, who he used to be, and trying to improve himself. It therefore makes a lot of thematic sense that every villain that he fights in movies that are centered on him 
are villains of his own creation because it's a very like it's not a particularly complex thing but it's like he's working on himself and trying to get over his past failures and so the villains he fights are people who he treated badly who are now trying to harm him it's a very simplistic kind of thing but i think it makes them work i think people misunderstand what jurassic park is about I think a lot of people think Michael Crichton was anti-science, which he was not. I well, think his movies are very... Well, in some ways. he was a climate change denier, but he also died in 2008. I don't think he would be one right now. But be, that aside, he wasn't anti-scientific progress. He, his books are obviously very anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I think that that's obvious from reading them. Jurassic Park is not Has Science Gone Too Far?, it's almost Lovecraftian in a way that's not quite picked up on, but I think the idea is this is capitalism toying with forces that are far beyond their comprehension or control. It's funny you mention that, because I kind of consider the spiritual successor of of the Jurassic Park themes of the mystery flesh pit. Yeah. Which is right. overtly Lovecraftian, but is like the... Holy fuck, I'm out of focus. Is is really one of the only media projects since to to really get it? Yes, mm. right, the, right. The idea is that it is not. Oh my God, science has gone too far. It created a T Rex. It is this corporation created a T Rex, and there is no possible way to control mm -hmm. that power. Yep. Th this is this is like it's like you've made a hurricane, and now it's 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 a it's a literal hurricane. It is beyond control. And I think it's why, like, in the original movies, and uh, with one notorious exception, people don't kill the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Like, they have guns that they can't use effectively. It's like, you know, Dr. Grant's carrying around a shotgun for a while at the end of Jurassic Park, and I think a lesser movie would have had him just shooting the raptors. The dinosaurs can only fight other dinosaurs and be killed by other dinosaurs. Yeah, did like, they kill any in the first one? No, nope. and the, I, I think uh, the reason everybody... Not on screen, I was going to say, I thought it was implied that he not on screen. one of them. Yeah. Uh, the, he, the raptor at the beginning, there's all the shoot her and then the huge amount of gunshots. That's a big one, though, right? So, like... Well, oh, no, I wasn't even thinking well, about that. I was thinking about later. But, he shoots at them and then the gun jams, but there's a bunch of, like, bullet holes in the glass and then the raptor is still chasing opens them. Opens the door, so I think it's yeah. That it, it okay. miss, he misses. So, like, it, it's not that he can't fight back, but that he can't do that. I think that's why everybody so hates the scene where Kelly gymnastics kicks the Velociraptor off the balcony mm. onto a, a spike and kills it. I had forgotten. Because I don't think that's a particularly stupid scene. If that were in a different movie, I think it would be fine. I think it's because it implicitly goes against the ethos of the franchise. I, I think it's why so much of the movie has to take place at night and in the rain, which are two circumstances where people feel the most vulnerable to nature, right? Like the scary parts of the movies, except in the second half of the franchise, are all parts where humans are at their weakest. Yeah, sure. Right. It, it's nature fighting back. I think that that is an important thing that the Jurassic World movies did not figure out. Like almost all of Jurassic World is during the daylight and it never rains. It, it's just you know it, it it's part of the DNA of the movies, so to speak. And there's that really affecting scene at the beginning of uh, Fallen Kingdom when they're yeah. like coming back to the uh, coming back to the island, turning on the power and stuff, and they have that absolutely amazing shot of like the guy like like on the phone like in the rain at night like looking over of just right. like what the phone doesn't work the lightning flash illuminating the silhouette of the t-rex behind him as he turns back around and it's just like oh that's great right no i that and then um i think dominion also lacks any scenes like that right like it, it becomes at night toward the end of the movie but like most of the movie is in broad daylight mm-hmm it, you know, it changes the way it's received. I, you know, the movies are fundamentally about attempts to control forces mm -hmm. that cannot be controlled, with with a heavy, I'd say, anti corporate yeah. bent to it. Um, I think that has to be centered. However, you write the movies. Yeah. Well, those are all great answers. They are. Well, guys, we've had a tremendously fun yeah. time answering your patron questions. Um, we'll be doing one of these videos roughly every month. We roughly. do apologize that we can't be strict with the schedule, but 
as you know, we're all very busy. We're all active researchers or professionals in the field of paleontology. This is not our full-time job. And, you know, it takes a lot of time to make these videos as good as they can be. We're all, active, research- right we're all active researchers in the field of paleontology. And Scott's here, too. <laughs> um. uh, yeah, but Scott, you're the only one really employed. So, Indeed. Jared, I got so nice. That was nice. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. I, w- I would love one of those. Um, before we go, we are going to fulfill the fulfill the requirements <laughs> that we have and our deal made to the patrons. Um, be- because it is important to us that we do everything we say we do. Um, so as many of you know, uh, or may not know, uh, patrons at our Gorgosaurus tier and up are entitled to have their name spoken aloud at the end of every video as a special thank you for their incredibly generous support. So we'll have the credits rolling right now featuring the names of every one of our patrons as of editing this video. Um, but we want to specifically highlight Benjamin Seipser, Philip Fico, Andrew Niddle, Florida Man, Max Ironpaw, Riley Shero, and Wheat who are incredibly generous with their support of our channel and are doing a lot to make sure that we can keep doing this and doing it to a degree that we're proud of, making videos that are not just videos, but we hope good videos. So thank you all. Thank you to all of our patrons. Um, Remember to submit your questions for the next patron Q&A. And this is the Skeleton Crew signing off. We'll see you next time. Bye, Bye -bye. everybody.